Um, so the, in this episode, in the meat part one, we're kind of we're gonna go through some of the science behind antioxidants. And know that there's like it's a bit over the place. Yep. Um, but before we dive into it, I did want to point out that we did already do an antioxidant episode back we in. Did. Episode 23. So y'all have heard this rant before. But now it's enhanced. It's better. It's bigger. It's rantier. So we should remind you that if you are looking for ECGC, pycnogenol, lipoic acid, CoQ10, please revisit that episode. Um, We're going to post the link down below. Um, It's episode 23. Um, This is actually just to... Further expand upon antioxidant the studies, the rant. what that means for <laughs> launches that are coming up, mm-hmm. and hopefully give you some tips and tricks on how to decode and how to discern what might actually be helpful and what might might be not so helpful. Yeah. So, yeah. so first things first, what is an antioxidant and why do we care? Um, and long story short, to kind of like simple it all down, um, the point of an antioxidant is to quench free radicals. Mm. And I'm like staring into Victoria's soul. I, I should have seen that coming. <laughs> All right. Free radicals, um, often referred to, you might hear of as ROS or mm-hmm. reactive oxygen species. These are these arise um, in skin when your skin undergoes things like a lot of sun. Mm-hmm. And so what the reason why these are so feared for us in skin and skin aging is that it can it's quite volatile it can interact with a lot of our main very important cellular components like mitochondria dna and the reason why is because it's missing an electron it's very very sad it's very very sad we'll include a comic here of to showcase why um and so when it has when it's missing it's got its lone electrons looking to pair up and so it tries to find a place and it that's how it's just so disruptive to you know like i said mitochondria dna even the cell nuclei so Mm -hmm. with that um that's where antioxidants come in um, because the idea is that it will go in and will quench these ros and then all things are stable again (laughs) so that's the idea of antioxidant but the reason why it's it's it feels like a relatively simple concept but part of the reason why this is such a difficult category for us to dissect is it's just really really big yeah there are so many things like literally anything feels like an antioxidant nowadays Mm -hmm. um just to to highlight how vast this category is you'll often hear about things like oh like blueberries like chocolate like these or plant extracts Mm -hmm. these things are antioxidants Mm -hmm. but as we mentioned on this podcast a few times within these extracts there are individual components so then you have scientists also looking at isolated components like like gallic acid, um, quercetin, and you have things like, you'll hear things like flavonoid rich. These are all different little individual compounds that scientists are still deciphering and figuring out. And sometimes you, you'll you find papers testing the whole extract. Other times you'll find papers looking at individual compounds. Mm-hmm. So it just it's just exponentially wild. Yep. And... You know, the problem with that is as they look at these isolated compounds, then you have a lot of noise coming in Mm -hmm. from outside industry that are touting like the latest and greatest new supplement and extract. And I wanted to share with you guys like how crazy it can get. So these are some of the things that are claimed as antioxidants. Um, And I can confirm that some of these are actually extracts that can be used in skincare formulation. So you have things like sage, rosemary, ginseng, artichoke, vinegar, and even hops. They can be claimed as antioxidants. So, so this is really for health reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, it's the only reason why I drink this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, that should give you an idea of just like, you know, to look at it as on an analytical level. And then, but then you have to fight through all of the noise from the actual industry. And hot mess, hot mess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, all right, let's bring it down to what that means for skincare. Yeah, so first of all, um, it takes a lot to test and validate an antioxidant. Mm-hmm. Now, on a very, very, very basic level, you test it in vitro or in test tubes. And there are these things called assays where basically, as Victoria mentioned, they throw them at some ROS, um, 
Then there are different species of ROS. Yeah. Um, we're not gonna get into that. We're not gonna get into terrifying. That. But basically, there's a few different tests in vitro where mm-hmm. they put them in with these different species, or you generate these species and see how the how the antioxidant do. Like, see if these species decline in the presence of these ingredients. And if it does, they're like. Who's all? You are an antioxidant. <laughs> I dub the antioxidant, and a lot of marketers will be like, "Oh my god, that's, that's awesome!" They're I'm like, gonna put, put it in the cream. cream. Go, 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 go! <laughs> yeah, and honestly, like if you haven't listened to us rant about testing before, that's not how this stuff works. It's not how you can claim that it's actually helpful for skin. Yeah. So, and we want to highlight. This is a good time to call out that most antioxidant studies are actually done in um, in oral injections, mm-hmm. in supplement form or just in diet studies. And a lot of times people will be like, oh my God, it's been tested on humans. Go, 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 put in a cream. Yeah. But that's also not how that works. Yes, uh, exactly. It's a completely different mechanism. So we need to know how does the antioxidant, the claimed quote unquote antioxidant work via skin. So Yeah. So this leads us to testing on skin. Where it's also a little wild. The thing is, there's a lot of really interesting studies that could be done. There isn't, there isn't necessarily one golden standard. Yes. I want to highlight a few interesting ones who came along. I mean, honestly, a range is so far and wide in between. There's studies done on punch biopsy mm-hmm. skin. There are studies done on banana peel. <laughs> and that one's my favorite that one's because really it cute. looks like a banana massacre. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh no, that didn't work. The banana's now black. <laughs> and if you're wondering why, what, how that works, what they do is they simply apply, as you know, if you leave a banana peel out, it will slowly turn brown. So what they do is they simply apply the topical um, solution on the banana peel and just see if it can prevent the browning from occurring or just uh, draw out that time. So yeah, anyways, bananas, who would have thought? Fun fact. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I did find a few interesting studies I really want to highlight. Um, There's one study done by um, a group of scientists. And one of the doctors on the study is Dr. Pinnell, who oh, is the founder of SkinCeuticals. The grandfather of ascorbic acid. Yes. He has done it again. Back <laughs> with another ascorbic acid test. <laughs> they extracted skin cells like fibroblasts from two different age groups. Mm-hmm. One super young newborn kids uh, at three to five, eight days old. Thank you for donating your f- fibroblasts to us. Yes. And uh, skin cells from the elderly at uh, 78 to 93 year old. Also, thank you for donating your fibroblast to science. Yes. And they put them in a culture and the skin cells um, kind of kind of proliferate and grow over mm-hmm. time. It's probably to no one's surprise that the newborn skin cells divide much, much, much quicker than the mm-hmm. elderly. But what's interesting is in the presence of ascorbic acid, and we'll show the charts here. It's a little hard to see, but in the elderly cells, you can compare to the newborn cells, you'll see that it's much slower than the newborn. But in the presence of vitamin C, they proliferate much faster than without. So it's kind of a cool way to show how cool, uh, how important vitamin C is to your skin skills. Now, just remember, this is in vitro. Mm-hmm. So um, again, like you have to look, we look at vitamin C data, um, the robustness of it, mm-hmm. how many numerous of tests, both in vitro, in vivo, in clinicals. So this only adds another piece. And I think it just... Uh, further, I would say, suggest that ascorbic acid um, is a great preventative step for aging. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And some of our favorite in vivo studies done on live human subject mm-hmm. is what we consider a- accelerated damage studies. Mm-hmm. So one uh, one way to do this is with us uh, UV induced erythema. You can apply a certain a, a controlled dose of UV light to patches of skin. Basically causing sunburns. Yes. And you can see whether or not with topical antioxidants that degree of burn is reduced. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what's used to justify ascorbic acid and how it can be a great uh, AOX in, par- in pairing with sunscreen. Um, it's also why we always promote uh, having vitamin C in your routine. Yes. Yeah. And there, and it's also been looked at in a similar type of study where the offense, uh, the offending 
offending thing person is not UV light anymore. They have similar type of study with diesel exhaust yes, and also cigarette smoke to simulate uh, pollution and other things that cause uh, uh, ROS in the skin. And if you're wondering how that works, um, usually they have little chambers where they'll put like, you know, your arm essentially in a contra- concentrated dose of um, exhaust or cigarette smoke and then see like and measure the amount of inflammation that occurs so, yeah. yeah and what's interesting sometimes like also it's so if you have a high enough dose it's so bad you will tan or have hyperpigmentation from mm-hmm. it it's pretty bad um but when that um that these kind of tests give us a pretty good idea that it works against the ros generated by these offending species i guess yeah i actually that that kind of brings up a can of worms Mm -hmm. because you can do these tests to give you an idea of topical performance but when it comes to start claiming performance for products and doing clinicals i feel like it can get really murky because Mm -hmm. now you have brands that are starting to look for things like pigmentation but then the the mechanism is a little bit different and so i feel like it, it kind of muddies the water and I think that's, you'll see as we continue to talk about this, how that can get really confusing. Yeah, I mean, a simple example is going back to the vitamin C example. If you do a clinical study at 12 weeks, you'll see that vitamin C brightens the skin. Um, But is it because it's working as a preventive antioxidant? Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to tell. And when it comes to other antioxidants, let's say you did one of these accelerated damage studies, It's hard to say whether or not you'll see any changes to your skin in 12 weeks because yeah. these accelerated studies is showcasing, you know, like damage that you might accumulate over a whole year yeah. concentrated into a week. So you might not see anything in a 12 week study. And I think it's part of the realm because yes. at the end of the day, what are antioxidants supposed to do? They're supposed to prolong and prevent or I guess slow down the aging process. And that takes years and no one has time or the money to study that. So that's why we do have to get a little creative with these studies and they're really just not, we can't say they're one-to-one comparisons of actual um, antioxidant performance. Yeah, Yeah, so again, this is why this this whole category is a bit of a leap of faith. Mm. So, where do antioxidants come from in your skincare? <laughs> um, a lot of it does come from food, yeah. like food trends. If it catches on, if it's a superfood, you bet someone's tried to put that kill in the cream before. Artichokes. Oh, God. Artichoke dipped Lit. to the face. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you have stuff like vitamin C, mm. grape stuff, <laughs> tea stuff. And right now we see mushroom stuff. So much mushroom stuff. So much mushroom stuff. And just know that even if some of these categories, and this is not what this episode is about, so we will not dive into <laughs> <laughs> their merits we only got one supplements. hour gloria yep. um but i just know that just because it works as an oral supplement does not mean it will work topically mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and there are so many ingredients that people have tried to make happen or transition from supplement to topical it just ha- hasn't happened so our team fetch award a reference that some of you might not get <laughs> i have to hand it to astaxanthin and quercetin mm-hmm. i feel like i've seen it at so many trade shows for the past yes. five years it's always lingering around in um i would say antioxidant like descriptions yes you'll see them reference these two for sure yeah and then it's stuff like the do you know it's six thousand times more powerful than vitamin c <laughs> <laughs> and, and i i caught this quote in one of the studies i looked at quercetin that i have to highlight here because uh-huh. it links right into our next rant oh god it goes me. The flavonoid quercetin shows excellent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, and it is proposed for the prevention and treatment of various skin conditions such as melanoma. Bold. Very bold claim. Bold. However, its low solubility and instability hinders its formulation. Oh! 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 Oh, Triggered! Triggered! That's so surprising for the antioxidant category. Yes! And so to wrap up me part one, we have to go around about, oh my god, antioxidant in no likey water. (laughs) And no likey oil, no likey oxygen, no likey sunlight. <laughs> what do you do with that? Oh, yeah, we're not speaking from experience no, of having to work with no. these things at all. Mm-mm, no, no, at no, all. no, no, no. Um, yes, I would say biggest active category 
with the most fussiest of ingredients has to be this category for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, Incredibly sensitive, just packaging nightmares. Yeah. Temperature. It's not great. Not great. And last, I mean, to sum up, again, this is what ascorbic acid is king. You'll hear us talk about you. I feel like we've all seen that hot dog water turn brown on you before. So people know that it's a fussy, difficult ingredient to work with. But That's with already it, good. Yeah, but at least we <laughs> understand the parameters yeah. and we've worked with this so that that's stable so true. enough. So, yeah. yeah. And I mean, we, again, definitely check back to episode 23. We talk about the issues with ubiquinone and EGCG. Um, same thing, you know, it's a lot of notations of the fact that it just doesn't do well in formulation and doesn't seem to be cut out for a long shelf life. And that's really our problem. And that's why the chemist exists to solve these problems. Or to rant about it over a couple of things. (laughs) So, yeah, um, this basically concludes me part one. And to kind of give you guys a preview, this rant is totally not inspired by the fact that Mr. Reliable Gen 2 will have silymarin, which is a very very yeah maybe (laughs) no she's absolutely right it's part Um, of the reason why it's delayed by the way (laughs) yeah we've been trying to do it right and be some fussy people yep 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 (laughs)